boring. Boring. Bore ring? Bore ring. That's right, today we're talking about the bore model of the atom. Hit the theme. Ain't nothing but a chem thing, baby. Too flipped out, teachers going crazy. Lancaster is a district that pays me. Unbreakable, so please don't try to break hey. this. But uh, back to the lecture at hand. Hello and welcome to another episode of Shu Fu coming at ya. I'm your host, Fu, and with me as always is Shu. Shu know it. So if you recall, in the last episode, we talked about electromagnetic radiation, or EMR, and how it had properties of both waves and particles, but we really didn't introduce any new models of the atom. And today, we're going to actually bring those two things together, electromagnetic radiation and a new model of the atom. Let's get started. Atomic History Part 4. Another epic sequel. EMR and the atom, a lesson from the atomic theory unit. Spectra. When white light is passed through a glass prism, the light separates into different colors based on their different wavelengths. Like a rainbow? We get what is called a continuous spectrum because the colors blend into one another. Like a rainbow. Atoms can produce a spectrum as well. If we pass an electric current through gases like hydrogen, neon, or helium, or heat in a flame, elements such as sodium, potassium, calcium, light is produced. If we take a look at the flames on the left, we see that there are different metals. These different metals have characteristic colors that they give off when they're heated in a flame. This is much like the different colors we'd see in fireworks. Now, if we look at the picture on the right, what we would often call a neon sign, we don't necessarily have neon in there. It can be a variety of gases because each gas gives off a different color when electricity is passed through it. If we pass this light through a prism, we don't get a continuous spectrum. Instead, each element has its own line spectrum or special set of spectral lines. These are the bands of color that you see in the picture below. Do you ever wonder how scientists know what a star that's billions of light years away is made of? We take the light from that star and we pass it through a prism and we analyze its spectrum. Now, since every element has its own distinct set of spectra, we match those lines up with the spectra we see from the stars, and then we know what that star is made of. We know that Jupiter has an atmosphere made up mainly of hydrogen and helium. Europa, a moon of Jupiter, has a very thin oxygen atmosphere, and HD 209458b, a Jupiter-sized exoplanet orbiting the star HD 209458, which is 154 light years away, has an atmosphere that contains hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, sodium, carbon dioxide, methane, and even water vapor. All this even though we haven't visited any of these places to directly sample the air. But we don't need to. We can study the air on other planets, moons, and exoplanets, just by looking at them, in particular by looking at light that bounces off or passes through their atmospheres, because when you shine light on a gas, the molecules absorb and scatter different frequencies of that light in different amounts. If we then split the transmitted or scattered light apart into its constituent colors using a prism or diffraction grating, we can see a molecule's light absorption fingerprint, or its light emission fingerprint. This is hydrogen. This is nitrogen oxygen, methane, carbon dioxide, water. So when we look at the sunlight bouncing off of the atmospheres of planets and notice spikes of certain heights in certain frequencies, we can carefully match those to the known fingerprints of gas molecules and learn not just what gases make up the air, but even their relative abundances. In fact, we don't even need to be able to see a planet at all to learn about its atmosphere. Many exoplanets have been discovered because they pass in front of their parent star, which we see as a dip in the overall intensity of the star's light. But if an exoplanet has an atmosphere, the gas gas molecules in its atmosphere will block some frequencies an extra amount, according to their molecular fingerprints, and we can do the same fingerprint matching process as before. And that's how we know what's in the atmosphere of HD 209458b. Of course, in practice, it's pretty darn challenging to use molecular fingerprints to study exoplanet atmospheres, because air is thin so the fingerprints are super faint and we need big sensitive telescopes and spectrometers, and because atmospheres are complicated and their fingerprints can be ambiguous or hard to match, and because different parts of a single star emit different amounts of different colors of light, so a planet's effect on the star's spectrum will depend on which part the planet passes in front of. But all of these difficulties can be dealt with by clever astronomers, and thus we have been able to figure out what the air is like on planets hundreds of light years away that we can't even see. Niels Bohr, Danish physicist, 1885 to 1962. 
Revise the Rutherford model by explaining these spectral lines. Bohr suggested that electrons orbiting the nucleus could only exist at certain energy levels, or distances from the nucleus, not at random energies in the Rutherford model. Bohr's explanation. When an electric current or flame passes through the atom, electrons become excited and jump from low energy levels, called the ground state, to high energy levels, called the excited state. The excited electron falls back to the low energy level and gives off energy in the form of light. Because there are specific differences in energy between the levels, only specific frequencies of light are seen in the spectrum. Thus, the spectrum is made of spectral lines and is not continuous. All right, let's say that I'm an electron. I'm an electron in the ground state right now. I'm in the lowest possible energy level. I'm close to the nucleus. I'm very stable. Now let's say a red photon of light comes my way. It actually passed right through me. The reason for that is that the red light at a low frequency, low energy, wasn't enough energy to send me to a higher energy level in the excited state. Well, let's try another one. We've got a yellow photon of light. So that comes by me, and as the electron, I absorb that energy. It happens to be the right amount of energy to send me up to a higher energy level. You see, I got taller. I'm now in the excited state with this light. I'm at a higher energy. The only problem is, I'm unstable now that I'm far from the nucleus. In fact, I'm afraid, for, I'm afraid of heights. I want to get down. So I'm going to fall back down to the ground state in a lower energy level. And as I do that, I'm going to give off yellow light. That's seen as a band of yellow color on these spectral lines. All right, so let's try another one. Let's try blue. Blue is higher frequency and higher energy. So now I can jump up two energy levels. I'm still in the excited state, but I'm at a much higher energy. Again, I'm unstable. I want to return to low energy close to the nucleus, and so I'm going to fall back down to become stable. And as I do that, I'm going to give off blue light. And again, I'm going to see a band of color that is blue as a result. So this image is a good example of the Bohr model of the atom. Remix! Some people also refer to it as the planetary model. And that's because the nucleus of our atom is much like the sun, and the electrons in those orbits or those rings are a lot like our planets revolving around the sun. Now, in this diagram here, if you look at the number one, we have energy particles coming in and being absorbed by the electrons in their orbits. Now, from one to number two there, you can see where the blue electron becomes a red electron, and it has absorbed the energy that came in. Now again, it's unstable. It wants to get back towards the nucleus to a lower energy level. So when it does that, it releases its energy in the form of light. Now because these energy levels are very specific and the rings are associated with a very specific amount of energy, the difference is always the same. So when you go from the first ring to the second ring, it's always the same amount of energy absorbed. So when you go from the second back to the first, it's always the same amount of energy released. So putting some things together, some reminders. In the ground state, we are very close to the nucleus. We are at a very low energy, but high stability. We can absorb energy to go to the excited state from the ground state. Once in the excited state, we are far in distance from the nucleus. We are at a high energy, but a very low stability and that low stability would lead to the electron returning to the ground state and releasing energy. Because only certain energies are allowed, energy is said to be quantized. In other words, the electron can exist only at very specific energies. This also means that the only way to excite an electron is by adding a quantum of energy. If you don't add the exact amount of energy needed to get to the next level, then it won't move at all. In this animation, we have gaseous hydrogen contained in a glass tube. When high voltages run through it, light is produced. That light is a combination of colors, so when the colors are separated in a prism, we see those as lines on a photographic plate. We can take a closer look at the bands of color that make up our line spectrum. We notice that there are four lines, even though hydrogen only has one electron. According to Bohr, electrons exist in specific energy levels. 
Even though hydrogen has one electron, it has multiple empty energy levels. The lines are produced when electrons from a higher energy level move to a lower energy level. When an electron moves from the third energy level to the second energy level, a red wavelength of light is produced. When an electron moves from the fourth energy level down to the second energy level, a green wavelength of light is produced. Now this is a much larger jump than the previous transition, and so a higher frequency of light is released, which also means more energy is released. When an electron moves from the fifth energy level down to the second energy level, this is an even bigger jump in energy, and a blue wavelength of light is produced. In our final transition, an electron moves from the sixth energy level down to the second energy level. We can see that this is the biggest jump of them all. Because of this, the highest frequency of light, and therefore the highest energy light, is released in the form of a violet wavelength. Well, that's going to do it for today's episode of the Bohr Ring Model. It's been emotional. Today's episode is brought to you by... Yearings. Make every day a special occasion. Leave your pair sold separately. But we never off, always zone to the break of dawn. S-E-I-E-N-C-E -E -E in the hall, they call S-Wing. You know we never wear it.